Hi, thanks. Um, thanks again for joining. Um, uh, today is the fourth in the series of uh, lectures, um, the introductory lectures that I am giving. Um, and uh, till yesterday, we talked about um, uh, the general uh, way of looking at the sky um, and uh, a general introduction to astronomy. And then we talked about how to measure things in the universe and uh, we were talking about uh, measuring distances till last time. And then we started talking about measuring the mass. And in general, measuring distances leads to an issue in measuring masses in the universe, which leads to our knowledge of the existence of dark matter and dark energy. And this is the substance of today's lecture. So it's a very, very general introduction because all these topics will be taken up later on um, in more detail. Um, in the cosmology lectures, for example, in the galaxy lectures, uh, talk about dark matter and galaxies. And then of course, uh, in my lectures later on, in clusters of galaxies, we'll also talk about um, dark matter and other ways of determining dark matter. So uh, these will be recurring themes in any um, subject of um, any, any lecture on current topics in astronomy and astrophysics. It is hard to avoid these subjects. But I'm talking today in the context of distance measures and mass measures, measuring things. So um, we talked about yesterday, we started talking about dark matter. And I was talking about how uh, the first evidence of dark matter came about, um, the first actually um, secure evidence. And this is to do with uh, contrasting the motion of stars in a galaxy to the motion of planets in the solar system. And we talked about how, because in the solar system, the mass is all concentrated in the sun, then um, each orbit of individual orbit of a planet um, behaves like all the mass is then in the center and you just uh, um, have a circular or almost circular orbit um, around the sun. It's very easy to calculate and Kepler's third law um, applies even if the orbit statistical Kepler's third law applies. And this means that the orbital speed as you go away from the, um, the sun goes down as um, uh, one over the square root of R. And it, it, it looks pretty good, even if you can count Pluto in there as a planet. Um, but in the case of uh, um, the galaxy, it turns out that there is a component where um, the um, in the in the uh, in the in the center, that uh, the velocities of the stars go up as a function of r, and it's proportional to r. So that's like solid body rotation. And in general, um, as you go out, you can see in the distribution of stars that it is uh, um, as you go out, the distribution of stars uniform uh, or not uniform but clumpy, but it's it's there. It's not like the solar system in which you do have. Um, uh, in, in which you do have the, uh, the planets themselves, and Pluto or whatever. But then uh, what you expect is that as you go out of the visible limits of the galaxy, if the visible part of the universe uh, was all that there is in terms of mass, then you would expect that outside this, because you know of, um, uh, as, as a general uh, theorem, one of the general theorems of, of Newton that come out of Newton's work, is you, we've all studied this, and this is for um, um, and true of, of charge distributions as well. Anything that is one over r squared is that as you go out, uh, as as you go out, go look at look at a distribution in shells, then uh, any distribution of matter inside your shell can be lumped together in the middle as a point object. Um, anything outside that does not count. The, um, cancels out, their effect cancels out, things like that. So um, in, the, in the case of the solar system, 
that that's easy. You can take everything into the in in any all of the matter that's inside your orbit, and it's essentially the sun. But it's hard to do that for the galaxy. But if you go outside a galaxy like this, and then you would say that this galaxy would then behave behave as as if it was a solar system, and so if you can find dust particles outside here, stars or whatever, uh, then if you measure the velocities, then that will behave as if um, the, all the mass was concentrated in the center and the, um, the velocities would fall off as one over r to the power half, like this. And this is what was expected till the 1960s, uh, till people started studying galaxies. And in any case, what you can do in galaxies, you can look at velocities. Um, if, you, if you study not face-on galaxies, but edge-on galaxies or partially edge-on galaxies, and, and then by Doppler shifts, uh, you can measure velocities. Uh, you can go from the center of a galaxy out and, and look at that. That's how we measure the rotation curve. And this is what Vera Rubin did. And Vera Rubin, in her uh, 1970 MSc thesis, uh, studied five galaxies in which she found that um, if you measure the, the rotation curve of, uh, of stars up to a point, they go up. And then out to the edge of the galaxy, it keeps going up. Now, what did she have as test particles outside here? She was using a radio telescope. So as you can see from here, here we have optical pictures of galaxies superposed on radio images in which the radio image represents the 21 centimeter uh, uh, emission uh, uh, in, in the radio band, of course, from the spin flip transition of hydrogen, uh, which is uh, uh, hydrogen uh, is the most abundant element in, um, in galaxies. So even if there is no star, there's quite a lot of cold gas and uh, in, in the form of atomic hydrogen. And in atomic hydrogen, this uh, uh, spin up to spin down, um, where the electron is uh, parallel to the proton in the nucleus, the spin to the other way around, that transition uh, is, uh, uh, comes out as 1420 megahertz or uh, 21 centimeter in wavelength. That's the most common thing that a radio telescope gets. So you can see that radio emitting gas is much more extended than the stellar part, the optical light emitting part of a galaxy. And this is what Vera Rubin was studying her master's thesis, and she submitted her paper. It was rejected by the Astronomical Journal, um, uh, partly because she was a young woman working in a science that where women were not uh, really uh, 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 working in the forefront at that time. Later, um, uh, this was repeated in a few years by, uh, male, uh, by uh, a more well-known male astronomer uh, who found the same result. And uh, as a result, um, people realized that Peter Rubin's result was, was excellent. Peter Rubin passed away a couple of years ago, and she grew to be one of the, the greatest astronomers of the last century. And uh, now we have one of the biggest telescopes that's being built uh, in the world, named after her. Um, so, uh, but at that time, she suffered the fact that she got a result that was quote, totally counterintuitive. That's what you expected outside the galaxy you expected things to fall off, but rotation curves are flat. Now, you can see the rotation curve is flat, and it keeps on rising in many cases. And it is fair to say, and I myself have observed uh, both in optical and radio now uh, rotation curves of, I don't know, many hundreds of galaxies. I've never seen one in which the actual rotation curve falls off. What does that mean? That means, very simply, if you think of these as, as in circular orbits, or even if it's not in a circular orbit, the circular velocity represents the gravitational potential well. Uh, you think about um, uh, a star uh, or a, or a, or a, or a uh, radio emitting atomic hydrogen particle uh, out here somewhere. And if its circular velocity is V squared, is V circ, then it is the, the centrifugal force or centripetal force is balanced by um, this quantity gm over r squared, where the mass here represents mass all the way out to that radius, just like I was talking about. You, um, and that, that comes as a consequence of Newton's basic theorem. And um, uh, so v squared over r, 
If you just do that, then the mass out to that radius goes at v squared r divided by g, which is a constant. <clears throat> so this is why when you have um, all the mass, the mass that is not a function of r, then v squared is proportional to r, and you have v uh, proportional to 1 over square root of r. But if rotation curves are flat, this means v, v squared is constant, and it does means then uh, mass is proportional to r. So as you go out, it shells mass, uh, it, it keeps on rising, proportional to r, which also means that the density goes as 1 over r squared. This means that even outside where the galaxy is seen, as you can see in stars, there is quite a lot of matter. And because we have on and measured rotation curves in many, 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 many galaxies, where the galaxies essentially end here in stars, but the rotation curves keep going, some of them mildly fall off, not really one over r, r to the power half. In many cases, it goes up or stays flat. And as I said, we haven't found any Keplerian fall off in any galaxy so far. So it is fair to say that we have not really found the edge to a galaxy yet. We don't know where galaxies end. We don't know where our galaxy ends. The stellar part, the stars in a galaxy, represent the disk and uh, bulge of the central bit of the galaxy, but it is embedded in matter, uh, which we call dark matter, for want of a better name. And the dark matter actually dominates the massive component of galaxies. Later on, in various parts of this course, you will come across evidence of various other kinds of dark matter. So distribution of dark matter uh, is very important. And then when you are looking at how what the universe is made of, it is predominantly made of dark matter. Because clearly, uh, you, if you look at a picture like this, um, we live in the central part of a galaxy where stars are around us, which are emitting light. But the dark matter, is, is uh, we don't know where till how, how long it can go. And um, you know people are trying to to find the extent of galaxies and, and trying to figure out till, till what radius we can actually see this matter. Uh, and uh, there are various ways of doing that. Uh, and we'll talk about things like gravitational lensing and stuff like that later on. So um, um, yeah, I think these are just uh, essentially the same thing. So the rotation curve of our galaxy then, present, uh, then gives the presence of dark matter. And you can see that this extra bit is the dark matter. But what is that dark matter? If, are they dark stars? Are they black holes? The interesting thing is that um, we know that in the beginning, I talked about the fact that we are made up of protons and neutrons and the elements of the periodic table, because these are made up of quarks. Leptons are not very massive. Uh, the, the, the atoms. Uh, that we are made up of, predominantly made up of quarks. And for things that, for a reason that will be told to you later on in the cosmology talks, we actually know very accurately how many quarks there are in the universe. This is from our study of the Big Bang. And we know how many baryons were created, how many protons and neutrons were created in the Big Bang. And we know this from various sources, many, many different sources. One of the predominant sources is we know that those baryons, as the universe expanded and the energy cooled, the first atoms to be formed were hydrogen and helium. And that's what we essentially we got from the Big Bang, hydrogen and helium, a little bit of lithium, and that's it. And the ratio of hydrogen and helium actually tells us very accurately. It's, a, it's an accurate measure, which will be explained to you later on, accurate measure of the total number of particles that were created as a result of the Big Bang. Now, if you add up all the dark, all the matter that you um, that you that you find in galaxies, in our galaxy and in our other galaxies, as happened in the 70s and 80s, and this was the time when I was doing my PhD, it was great fun to do this to figure out how much matter there is in the universe that you can you can figure out from dark matter. Um, it is far far more than the baryons, the number of baryons we um, we know exist. So we know that dark matter is not baryonic. 
And when that was found, then initially people said, okay, then are they leptons? So neutrinos, for example, at that time, of course, we didn't know that there was, neutrinos were massive, that they had any mass. But neutrinos have such little mass now, we know the middle limits are so much that it would be very difficult to find so many neutrinos to make up dark matter. And there are other consequences of having neutrino dark matter that, again, will come later on when people talk about you know, cosmology and large scale structure. So um, people um, think about dark matter could have been, at the beginning, there were all these ideas that came out. There were machos, which are massive, compact objects like black holes. Now, the problem with black holes uh, is that black holes are also baryonic because they are remnants of stars. So they can add up to the, the total number of baryons, but most of the dark matter has to be non-baryonic. So the dark matter cannot be massive, compact, hello objects like black holes and white dwarfs and, and, and stars that are dark that don't emit light. So um, we know that the, these are, are, the, are, are have another name, which is called WIMPs with weakly interactive massive particles, um, like neutrinos with mass. We, don't, we haven't found them yet. Or it could be axions. It could be supersymmetric particles. It could be all kinds of, uh, it's probably um, GeV particles, much more massive than protons and neutrons. And these we haven't found yet. So we don't know what most of the universe is made up of. But we know that they are not made up of the same things that we are made up of. Okay. So I will stop there on this topic because um, other people will take this up. And what I will do is go on with the story of, um, of measuring distances in the universe because that gives you the next step in the story and that of dark energy. So we know that the universe, the general picture, and this you'll do in great detail in the cosmology lectures, we know that the universe has started from the Big Bang and it's been expanding. You will, you will know, you will learn about inflation and stuff like that and the cosmic microwave background radiation. All that will be done later on. But we now know that the universe is 13.8 billion years old or 13.7. There's an error margin there. But, you know, this is much better than um, 200 years ago when people thought the universe was 4,000 years old. Newton thought the universe was 4,000 years old. At the time of Kelvin, in the 1850s, 1860s, Kelvin thought the universe was a million years old. Um, at the time of Einstein, people thought the universe was maybe 100 million years old because Darwin's theory had to work, or, or maybe a billion. Uh, and, and now we know that it is 13.8 billion years old, right? So this, that, and, and it's, it, it, the, the error margin in that is very small, right? All that will come to you later on. But one of the major ingredients in our knowing this comes from our uh, confidence in measuring distances to galaxies, not by parallax, not by, um, uh, not by the, uh, the other primary methods that I told you, but by some very clever methods that have been used in the last, um, last 100 years. And this is what I'm going to talk about now. So, you know, I mean, if you, a lot of you might, might have read uh, or even um, absolutely possess, um, um, you know, Stephen Hawking's famous book, Brief History of Time. A lot of us have been um, very, um, um, you know, um, encouraged by it. Uh, it's inspired by it. A lot of people, when I ask them, they say, oh, because I read Hawking's book, I came into astronomy. Um, I actually, as, as a first year PhD student, attended the lectures um, that turned into this book. And let me tell you, just attending those lectures, the 15 lectures that turned into this book, um, was extremely inspiring. But it was it was totally pathbreaking because it it told you what the story of the universe is, um, of starting from the Big Bang and uh, and and then where it is going to go. And in this particular book, it's very interestingly, Hawking points out in a very um, candid manner the fact that uh, starting from the Big Bang, the universe is expanding now. But the future of the universe depends on how much matter there is in the universe, right? Because, as you know, matter pulls, gravity pulls. And so if, um, for example, when you throw up something up in the air, it comes down because the Earth pulls it back. But if you can throw it at a speed that's more than the escape velocity, it will escape. 
So Hawking had this interesting idea of the future of the universe being um, um, uh, being governed by the total mass in the universe. And this is why our knowledge of how much matter there is, is very important. This is what spurred on people to, to look at dark matter, the sources of dark matter and the measures of dark matter and things like that. Because Hawking very clearly said that if there is not enough in, in that particular book, this has been known for a long time, this comes out of uh, the solutions of Einstein's equations that were done from when GR was published, um, the fact that um, the universe is expanding, but the only thing that can bring it back, uh, the fact that there could be a closed universe, which means that the universe expands up to a point and then comes back again, um, uh, would be if there is enough matter. Uh, so this is called the closed universe. And there is an open universe in which the universe just keeps on expanding. And then there is a, 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 a in-between phase, which is called the flat universe, which uh, means that there is just right. There's a, a critical density of the universe that is the demarcation between these two states. And, and there, um, the universe will keep on expanding, but will uh, its geometry is going to be flat. In the case of the open universe, the geometry is going to be hyperbolic. The, in the closed universe, the, the, the uh, universe is going to be curved in a positive sense, in which means that in space itself, if you draw a tiny triangle, then the three angles will add up to greater than 180 degrees, less than 90 degrees, and in a flat case, equal to 180 degrees. So this is the kind of thing that you will hear when, when cosmology is, is taught to you. But where, the, where does my idea of you know, measuring distances to galaxies feature in all this? Of course, in order to discover the fact that the universe is expanding, to experimentally establish the fact that the universe is expanding, one needed to measure distances. So in the cosmological distance ladder, remember, we went up to here, but we didn't go up to measuring distances to galaxies yet. Yeah. And this was essentially done by using standard candles. I talked about standard candles, but the standard candles that we've talked about before um, uh, won't work for galaxies, you have to find something in galaxies, external galaxies, not our galaxy, but external galaxies, which will be a standard candle. And this was found by this remarkable person called Henrietta Leavitt in, in the early part of the 20th century. In fact, um, at Harvard University at that point, uh, as is in most universities, I mean, all universities in the world, women were allowed to attend lectures but not get degrees. Harvard started giving degrees to women in the 1930s, Cambridge in the 1920s, Oxford in the 1920s. Uh, in fact, in India, we gave uh, degrees to women earlier than that. I think the British experimented with giving women degrees in India first before doing it in their own country. Um, and, and, and so uh, in, in Harvard, there were a large number of undergraduate people who uh, were studying at Harvard, but not really being able to sit for exams. And this is a gang of such people in, in the uh, women's college at Harvard called Radcliffe, which is right across from um, the astronomy department at Harvard. Hindu to leave it worked there uh, as an instructor and had a large number of uh, her assistants who were undergraduates at Harvard, but also working in the observatory. And they studied photographic plates of large number of stars um, to figure out how they varied by eye very meticulously. They measured the, um, the variation of the, the flux from these stars. And they discovered some amazing things. And one of the things they discovered is this thing called a Cepheid variable. <clears throat> so Cepheid variable is a, vari a variable star that varies of the order of days. In fact, in a standard, um, you know, undergraduate experiment is to, these things are actually naked eye. You can actually see them uh, even, uh, some of these are, are naked eye stars. Uh, if you know how to measure, uh, and many, many people do, they train themselves to measure the brightness of stars just by looking at it. Uh, but then you can also use photometric methods like Professor Gupta talked about, um, where uh, you can take a simple photometer or a, a digital camera and measure the brightness of the stars. And you can see that these stars um, go, um, this is bright and this is faint um, uh, over a period of five days. 
Sometimes it is six, six days, sometimes it's 10 days, sometimes it is less than a day. Uh, it, it depends on the Cepheid variable. Now, what they found was that the period of variability depends on the mean brightness of a Cepheid variable. So that's handy to leave its contribution. So that makes it a standard candle because you can measure the period of oscillation, pulsation of, and these are actually, we now know that these stars are stars that are pulsating as a whole, they've gone out of equilibrium as they've come out of the main sequence. And so they're pulsating as a whole and more massive stars pulsate at a different rate than less massive stars. And then thus it is related to the total amount of light that comes out of the star. So you can find the period very well and thus that period tells you what the luminosity of the star is and that's a standard candle. So if you can find the Cepheid variable, and by spectroscopic analysis established that it's actually a Cepheid variable, not any other kind of variable star, then you know the distance to that object. So these are some, sorry, this is where Cepheid variables lie in the, um, uh, in the, in the, in the HR diagram. Uh, that, that's not important now. The important thing is, is to see how time and days, how some of these Cepheid variables vary. And there are some are long period and some are short period, and that gives you an idea of how far away they are. Once you do that, this is what um, these people um, did in the 1920s. Very remarkable people. Edwin Hubble. Um, Edwin Hubble was a, a very important um, astronomer who became an astronomer much later in life. He was a lawyer, and uh, he went to fight in the First World War uh, for um, for the U.S. In, in, in Europe and in the French, uh, uh, in a war uh, in France, he lay in the open trenches and looked at the sky and thought, I'm in the wrong profession, I shouldn't be a lawyer. So after the war ended, he went back to university, to Chicago, and uh, enrolled in astronomy in his, in his 30s. And after he uh, finished a degree in physics and astronomy, he got a job um, at Mount Wilson Observatory in California. Um, and one of the first things he was asked to do, and here he is standing at the um, at the 100-inch telescope, the 2.5-meter telescope at uh, Mount Wilson, which was then the largest telescope in the world. Um, he was asked to use a spectrograph on this telescope and see whether he, they, he could obtain the spectra of these nebulous objects that were found. See, the story always comes back. That were found by Herschel and by Messier. And to figure out what these nebulous objects were, things that were not like stars, right? And he started taking spectra of these things. He was, uh, he, in fact, um, um, uh, Milton Humerson was his assistant. He was uh, actually uh, um, the um, um, driver of the, of the institution and also a person who worked um, as one of the um, employees a uh, non-astronomical -astronom employees at the institution. He became his assistant, and Humerson and Hubble actually then um, started um, studying these. Uh, always when you do something completely new that nobody's done before, you make amazing discoveries. And, and what he did was he found that, um, that these, uh, these, these nebulae, many of them, uh, had um, uh, chemical compositions that were uh, the same, same as stars. I showed you that some of those nebulae were stars, but he also found by spectroscopic analysis that you, you, can, you can know there's a barcode in the spectrum. These, every element we know, we, we do this in chemistry lab, you can identify elements in the spectrum uh, by, by looking at um, the emission lines and absorption lines, and that tells you what particular element there is. Here's the spectrum of a galaxy. You can see that there are absorption lines which are, say, calcium H and K, there's magnesium B, there is hydrogen, there's oxygen, et cetera, all those emission lines and absorption lines. And they started identifying these things. And they found that in many of these cases, hydrogen lines, for example, are always there, H alpha line at, um, at, at 6,670 um, uh, angstroms, these are, sorry, 6,570 angstroms, and, and these are extremely um, bright uh, emission lines. Now you can see that in the lab, you know it's rest wavelength, but if you look at the Orion Nebula, for example, which is a nebula in our own galaxy, 
you still find it and it's essentially at rest wavelength. But as you go to galaxies, things that you, you found these spiral nebulae have uh, red shifts that are um, much, much bigger than the red shifts that you find of nebulae in our galaxy. Um, of course, they didn't know what galaxies were at that point, but certain, some of these nebulae, particularly the spiral nebulae he found, were actually had positive um, red shifts. Uh, the, the line had been shifted towards the red, and this was interpreted as a Doppler shift. And you can see the further away the galaxy or, or this particular nebula is, the further away this line shifts to the right. And as you can see, by the time you've gone to the farthest things you could see, this had gone to 7,000 something um, uh, angstroms. And so he interpreted this as the fact that um, the further away a galaxy is, um, these things are, which were then identified as galaxies, the faster it is moving away from us, right? So this is the plot um, he, he plotted. Uh, it's not a very, um, uh, it's not a very accurate plot. I mean, if I had a student who came with a, a plot like this, velocity versus uh, distance, and I'll tell you in a minute what the distance and, and plotted these points and drew a line through it, I'm not sure I'll accept it, but this is what he published and it, he turned out to be right. The distances to these nebulae he measured by finding many of them, by finding Cepheid variables in them, uh, following the method, the standard candle method that I, I talked about. Actually, uh, uh, through his this biggest telescope in the world, to find Cepheid variables in some of these. And in some of these, he used the size of the galaxy as a distance indicator, uh, which is not very accurate. Anyway, so here is Hubble's plot as published <coughs> uh, in 1929. And, and Hubble and Hermeson, and uh, error bars are not plotted on this, but there is a line that's done, done through this. And from this, he essentially said, look, majority of the galaxies, apart from, as you can see, three galaxies here, um, three galaxies here, which have negative velocity, which are coming towards us. Remember, we know one of those galaxies, and that's the Andromeda galaxy, which is coming towards us. Um, three galaxies that are coming towards us, turns out all three of them are in the local group. All the other galaxies are moving away from each other. And the fact that all galaxies are moving away from each other, uh, and, and as he went on repeating his experiment, he found everything else is moving away from each other. It means, it either means that we are in a preferred place in the universe, or it means that the universe itself is expanding. And that's the, the picture that uh, Hubble, ex now, actually this uh, would have been a result that people would have debated a lot had it not been the fact that before that, in the 1920s, two uh, independent people, um, Father Lemaitre in, uh, in the Sorbonne University in Paris and uh, Alexander Friedman in St. Petersburg had solved Einstein's equations and shown that the only solutions, if you applied Einstein's equations of general relativity to the universe, the only solutions you can have are not static solutions. They are either solutions in the universe is coming, uh, is collapsing, or they're expanding. And Einstein was not very happy with it. As you know, Einstein thought that the universe had to be static. Um, and, and so this debate was already going on. And Hubble producing this meant everybody rushed to meet him. Einstein went and, and met Hubble. Lemaitre went and met Hubble. Everybody started looking at his results. And then they realized that there is evidence now of the universe itself expanding. <clears throat> the current state of that is the fact that the Hubble Space Telescope was sent up in 1990 to do exactly that. The Hubble Space Telescope now has turned out in the last 30 years to be one of the greatest things that we have used. But its purpose of being sent up was to find Cepheid variables in distant galaxies. That was his, its mission. And the digital camera was actually developed for it, the CCD, uh, which now we use in our phones, uh, a similar digital device. But um, it, it was essentially designed, and that's why it was called the Hubble Space Telescope, for this key project, and that was to find Cepheid variables in, um, in galaxies. So Hubble's law, 
which comes from this velocity proportional to distance is written like this. And this H naught then is the slope of this line that actually gives you a measure of the expansion rate of the universe. And in Hubble's original paper, this number was 550, um, which led to an expansion of the universe that is very different from what we now know. Now, um, as a result of the Hubble key project, uh, this has come, uh, this came down to be measured from nearby galaxies, at least, out to the Virgo cluster of 72 plus minus 8 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Um, right now, from various other uh, methods, this number varies between 68 to 72, which is a wonderful state of affairs. When I was doing my PhD in the 1980s, this number varied from 50 to 100. And in the 1930s, this number was 500. So you can see this number uh, is being now measured to a very great deal of accuracy. And you can see that this is the kind of spread in that. And if you look at the status in 1995, before I go on to the last bit of what I'm talking about, <clears throat> 1995 was a, a year when everything changed. And when everything changed in 1995, the best measures of um, the distances to galaxies using Cepheid variables and similar variables like RLIV and um, uh, with these distances <clears throat> and the velocities measured from spectroscopic means. As you can see, the errors had come out, come down very nicely. Um, it's not a scatter plot like Hubble's plot was. These are mostly um, uh, uh, data from the Hubble Space Telescope from the key project. And it gave a very nice straight line of 72 plus minus 8. Hubble's original galaxies would fit in this little yellow box. Right. So we had by 95 already gone far, far, far beyond the galaxies Hubble could study. Right. But the question is, it's still a straight line. <clears throat> Now, I want you to understand one thing, if you haven't figured it out already. When we look away from us, we look into the past of the universe, because light takes time to come to us. So when I'm studying a galaxy that is 1,200 light years away, 1,200, sorry, 1,200 million light years away, we are looking at the universe that is 1,200 million years younger than the current time. So when I'm measuring the expansion of the universe at that time, it should be different from the expansion rate now. Because remember Hawking's idea of the fact that the universe starts with a bang, and depending on how much matter there is in the universe, it's going to be pulled back. And so the universe should be slowing down. And, and so if I look in the past, the universe should be moving faster. And, and the slope of this line should be steeper as you go further and further away. I hope everybody understands. Further away means earlier in the age of the universe. And if the universe is slowing down, then it means that the universe was faster in, in expanding in the past. And that means because the slope of this line gives you the rate of expansion of the universe, it should actually have a different slope as you're looking. So how far fr away from us is Hubble's law, which is essentially a straight line valid. It has to curve at some point, right? And in until 95, we did not know how to do that because our, philosophy, our distance measures were not inadequate. Cepheid variables cannot be seen beyond about, uh, ab about this distance, really. And, and uh, very far away galaxies, as soon as you get to uh, a few, uh, uh, about 100 million light years, actually beyond 30 or 40 million light years, you cannot see uh, 30, or, uh, 30 or 40 million parsecs, you can't see Cepheid variables at all. So we needed a different um, standard candle. And this was discovered in 95. So here was Hubble's original plot. We know that the universe is expanding. Actually, uh, I like to show this uh, uh, plot rather than this plot. If you think of the universe expanding, 
because the balloon is a two-dimensional thing. You think of space-time itself is expanding, as 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 Hubble is talking about, and we are embedded in this space-time, and we are going away from each other because space-time itself is expanding. That's the idea, and this will be done more formally, I think, in the cosmology classes, right? So, um, so the idea is that if you look at space-time as a uh, fabric of space-time, that itself will expand. So, um, in '95, we knew that there was a lot of dark matter in the universe, but it was still, um, uh, if it were um, closed um, uh, close to the critical density, then it would um, pull back the universe. But we couldn't find, even if we measured all the um, baryonic matter, which is far less than the critical density, and we looked at all the dark matter in the universe and added them together, it was nowhere near the critical density. So um, it was clear that the universe is going to expand forever, but it should at least slow down because of the matter. We know that we are here, so there's matter in the universe. And so um, finally, this was found. Found what was found was that the thing called type 1a supernova. Type 1a supernovae, uh, as a standard candle, were found, the, which has a wattage limit, which means that you know exactly what the standard candle, what, what the absolute luminosity of the, um, of the standard candle is. Type 1a supernovae are supernovae, which are when the star, when a star explodes, the entire star explodes, leaves nothing behind. And what they look like is as follows. And the brightness of such a thing lasts, uh, it, it goes up, up to a point, and then comes down and uh, for about a month. And it reaches a peak in which they are so bright that you can see them in very distant galaxies. It becomes almost as bright as a whole galaxy. Here's an example of a type 1a supernova that happened in 1987 in the large Magellanic clouds in the satellite galaxies. And this was seen with the naked eye by people in the Southern Hemisphere. You can see this star became that. And it was naked eye object. For distant galaxies, you can, you can see them. If it's a galaxy like that, you can see them brighten up and then fade. Here's another one that happened in a nearby galaxy a few years ago. And you can see them. Now, the interesting thing is they go up and they come down. And if you can catch them before they become the maximum, then the maximum itself gives a standard candle index. It means that it tells you how bright that supernova is. And they're all, uh, they can be calibrated to be the same. Actually, it's a combination of the width of this uh, line and the maximum. Both of them can be measured from the Earth, and the combination of the width and the maximum tells you um, how um, bright the object is, and that means it tells you um, how far away it is, the distance, because you can, you can just look at it and measure its flux. Right. So once that was realized, um, and so these are very interesting supernovae. These are um, when you when you learn about the the origin of these things, very interesting. These supernovae are essentially uh, in a binary pair, and a massive star uh, dumps uh, uh, evolves and dumps uh, some uh, um, uh, matter onto the the the, um, uh, the companion. And if the companion is a white dwarf. Sometimes when the matter is dumped on it, so much matter is dumped on it, it cannot sustain it. It goes out of equilibrium and blows up as an entire star. The whole star blows up, leaving nothing. So that is the origin of a type 1a supernova. And you can see that um, these are um, different type 1a supernovae, and uh, they have different widths and different heights, and they can be adjusted to uh, make a template supernova, and by comparing with it, you can say how far away it is. Okay. So they become standard candles. So once this was discovered, a standard procedure started where there were all these telescopes that were dedicated to uh, finding these supernovae. And one of the telescopes that I showed you when I showed you the picture of the Milky Way 
was one of the, the telescopes that were dedicated in Cerro Tololo, that's here, um, <clears throat> to take pictures of the sky every night and, um, and then subtract it from pictures taken of the same parts of the sky, about 50 to 100 fields, um, and, and then digitally finding out uh, what has changed. And if they were, they were thought to be a supernova, then suddenly the Hubble Space Telescope, the Keck Telescope, bigger telescopes with spectrographs would take a spectrum. The spectrum would establish whether it's a type 1 supernova. And then that's it. Then you, what you do is you, you wait till it, it gets to a maximum. And then you have the standard count. That's the telescope I was talking about. This is now being made into a dedicated telescope called the Dark Energy Telescope um, uh, and uh, Dark Energy Survey. And that's the telescope I showed you in this picture. This is one of the major telescopes that does this. There are many others who are on all the time looking for these, um, these standard candle measurements of the supernova. So now we go back to Hubble's plot in 1995, and I showed you it's still a straight line, and where 1929 data fits in there, as a result of the first few years of these supernovae, um, this was found. Right. So, and this is five years after um, the discovery of supernovae as a as a standard candle, and you can see already all these galaxies will fit into that little yellow thing there. You've gone out to um, tens of gigaparsecs now, and the surprise was that instead of the Hubble plot departing in a way that would curve upwards to make the universe expand faster in the past, the universe was in fact slower in the past in expansion. So this is how we discovered that the universe is speeding up, it's accelerating. This was not in Hawking's book, so you can throw away Hawking's book really, because um, because in the 1980s and 1990s, we had no idea that the universe will spring such a surprise on us. The fact that the universe is actually not dominated by matter. We were looking for the missing matter, the dark matter. It turns out that the universe cannot be dominated by matter. The matter pulls back. Matter is gravitating, right? This led to the Nobel Prize for these people. Brian was a student. Um, and Adam was a postdoc when I was a when I was a postdoc at Harvard, uh, and uh, these uh, these people were working on this then, and they got the Nobel Prize for finding what is known as the accelerating universe. And what happens it means then that right now we know that the universe, as a result of the, this work, and you will hear of this in in more detail later on that about 70% of the universe, mass energy of the universe, is a component that is pushing the universe apart, is making space-time accelerate as it expands. And for some strange reason, it is called dark energy. It is neither dark, of course it's dark, everything is dark, anything that's dark, light is dark. Um, it is energy, but people um, have a um, odd, um, idea of what it is from its name, it, it just to distinguish it from dark matter, it's called dark energy because it is not matter, it is not gravitate. We don't know what dark energy is. There's a lot of, there are many, there may be many, many people here in the audience who are working on um, uh, trying to figure out a field theory of dark energy, a, uh, an origin, uh, 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 original uh, model of, of dark energy. Um, there are a lot, loads of them coming out now, and we don't know what they are. We know roughly what its um, uh, what its uh, um, uh, equation of state is, but we have no idea. But we know it is not gravitating. So now, if you look at the mass energy budget of the universe, we know mass energy. Is the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, when I was a PhD student, we used to think that the universe is made up of matter, and so we were worried about not finding this dark matter, which makes up 70% of the matter. Yeah, but you know now the matter itself is 30% of the mass energy of the universe, out of which so-called ordinary matter, which is baryonic matter, matter that we are made up of, is about 5%. The dark matter part of it makes up about 25%. And the other 70% is essentially made up of this expanding. Um, so 
Um, I, I'll give you a few references here. Uh, and these books are um, available um, on the web, um, and uh, 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 PDFs are readily available. Um, there are uh, many um, uh, online references given here, and the slides of all the lectures that I've shown you so far, I will put up um, uh, for you so that you can, you can take a look at it. There are, um, in particular, uh, the Cosmology textbook by Barbara Ryden. Um, she's made the entire book available as a PDF on the web, free for everybody. Um, you can take it down from there, her website, and it has this whole story. Uh, and introductory astrophysics, etc. A lot of them are there. Okay, so I'm going to uh, stop sharing, and and then um, and look at um, what questions people uh, might have. Um, I'll bring up the um, the Google Docs, but if if you have any questions, please ask in the chat box, or um, uh, or or you can put up your hand and um, unmute yourself and um, ask questions, okay? Um, yes, um, let's be on uh, Shloksha, you are on top. Please ask your question. Uh, hello, sir, am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, uh, sir, can you again explain uh, how did that uh, acceleration part was discovered? Like how did the uh, data derived by Saul Perlmutter, Rees and Smith, uh, deviate from what Hubble discovered. So they thought that no, it's not just expansion, but it's acceleration. Okay, let me bring up my, uh, my PowerPoint again. And uh, um, I will go to this particular slide. I'll show you. So you can see that in, in, the, in the previous slide, I showed you that this is straight. This means the velocity is proportional to distance. And as you are going further and further away, as I said, um, you are looking into the past because light takes time to come to you. So when you're looking at this galaxy, this is 400 megaparsecs away. This means it's 400 million parsecs or 1200 million light years away. And this means you're seeing the universe as it was 1,200 million years ago. And if this falls on this uh, straight line, this means that the universe is expanding uniformly uh, without any acceleration or deceleration. And when I'm uh, so that 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 galaxy falls on that line. But when the supernovae happened, as you can see also that this is up to 500 megaparsecs. 500 megaparsecs is here, right? Now I'm going to 10 gigaparsecs. And as you go further and further away, you can see that this line that these original points were on is that black line. And the line that we find is that the Hubble line is now curved. It is no longer proportional. Velocity is not proportional to distance. Now, that means that you're looking in the past, and in the past, the galaxies are telling you, and I also told you that the slope of this line tells you the rate of expansion of the universe. So in the past, you find that the rate of expansion of the universe was slower because it's flatter than the line now, the slope of the line now. And so in the past, the universe was expanding at a slower rate than now. So it means it's sped it's, it's up, and that's that's the... And that's the rationale of, of my saying this, the fact that in the past, the, the universe's expansion was much slower. Uh, I said that we had expected the line, uh, the Hubble line, to actually go up like that, which meant that the universe was slower in the past, um, sorry, faster in the past, and so the, the expansion of the universe was higher, the rate of expansion. And now we see that it's gone the other way, which, uh, which is uh, now, you know, not just from supernovae, uh, this experiment has been uh, repeated in many different ways. You will hear of this later on uh, in uh, the fact that uh, the evidence of dark energy doesn't only come from um, this particular experiment, but this was the first experiment that showed it. I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir, thank else? you so much. Anybody else?
there were other hands that were up. Um, please um, ask a question. I'm just looking at the chat box. And uh, um, uh, I don't understand Amit Pandey's question about is it searching Mark Michelson Morley searching for ether? Um, what does that mean? I just showed you some evidence, and uh, later on you'll see evidence of how um, how these things are, are are found, not just by one method, not just by one experiment, but by ten different experiments. One can now search find dark matter to give you the same answer. Um, how did we exactly calculate the percentage of dark energy? We calculate the percentage of dark energy by looking at the curvature of that line in this particular case, and that, and then um, take that line and fit it to um, a solution of Einstein's equations that, um, that describes uh, the expansion of the universe. So essentially, space-time is described by Einstein's equation of general relativity. And uh, if you take uh, the, the space-time metric that, um, that is expanding and you add a parameter to it that uh, it, uh, talks about like, acceleration or deceleration, then that parameter can be uh, measured from that curvature of the line. So this is from the supernova. Now, you have the same things that from the cosmic microwave background, you have the same uh, measurements that are made from clusters of galaxies, um, which where um, the parameter comes in a different way when you measure um, these things, and that all that gives you a, an idea of um, the percentage of dark energy and the relative amount of dark energy and dark matter. Um, um, Devesh, uh, yes, Ma sir. Please go ahead. Ask sir, uh, sir, please tell about the seeded variables again. Um, you can look at my notes uh, um, if, when I when I send it to you, or look up the variables on um, <clears throat> and very very uh, a lot of resources on the web. Cepheid variables are nothing but variable stars that uh, um, that uh, that pulsate that go big and then come small, etc. And and so as a result, their 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 brightness goes up and down. And uh, um, because uh, more massive stars oscillate slowly compared to more uh, um, less massive stars, um, and the luminosity of a star, if you look at black body, black body radiation goes as the area of the of, of the sphere times uh, 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 temperature to the power four. As you know, things like that. It, it, it's proportional to the area of the star. So bigger stars. Um, have a different luminosity than smaller stars and things like that. So these relations mean that um, the actual luminosity of the star itself uh, is related to the, um, the period of the pulsation. And so once you measure the pulsation, which you can measure without uh, uh, any uh, knowledge of the distance of the star, you can find out how bright the star intrinsically is, which is the standard candle. Right. So you know how bright it is, and then from how bright it appears to you, you can find this thing. So that's the basics of a Cepheid variable. There are many other variable stars, but not everybody has this relation between them, the relation between the period and the velocity. Um, there is another class of stars called RLIRI variables, which also do that, but they are very faint. They, they are not seen in uh, very far away galaxies. In our galaxy, we measure distances from RLIRI. Right. So, anybody else? Uh, uh, Shubhrut Sarangi has a question. You can unmute and ask your question. Yeah, go ahead. Ask your question. Yeah. Am I audible now? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, actually, I. As far as, I mean, I understood that uh, the uh, dark matter particles are not, we are not so sure uh, as yet. What are the dark matter particles? So uh, how do we exactly differentiate between dark matter and dark energy? I mean, what are the evidence uh, that we got uh, on the basis of which we are saying that dark matter is different and dark energy is different and uh, 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 there is so much percentage of dark energy and so much percentage of dark matter in the universe? 
are there any signal or any evidence on which on the no, basis no, of which I, yeah, yeah i understand i told you that energy uh, dark energy and dark matter are different because dark matter pulls and dark matter dark energy pushes two different okay, things okay okay Okay. So, so, okay. Uh-huh. so matter gravitates, uh-huh. so uh, it yeah, yeah. slow down the universe. Mm-hmm. So the fact that the universe is accelerating, it means that it cannot be matter. So there has to be more dark energy, which is the accelerating part of the universe than dark matter. To begin with, you know that the, the relative amount has to be different. And then the curvature, the actual curvature of that line tells you the, the relative uh, uh, thing. Then it's all done. If you go to the original papers and things like that, which I didn't do here, and I think later on um, these things will be done properly. Uh, you have another four weeks to go after this. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. This will be done for you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me look at the chat box. Uh, there are people who are um, uh, who think that dark matter doesn't exist. There, um, sir, you showed a graph with this Kriti talks about a radius of different universe versus time. Um, <clears throat> no, not radius. Sorry, what what was um, you you understood wrong? The on the wire in in that plot that I showed in the Stephen Hawking plot of um, the universe uh, either coming back on itself or expanding forever. The y-axis, the radius, meant it is the measure of distance, uh, which is called the scale factor, which is essentially a measure of distance on space-time. And if the basic unit of distance on space-time goes as function of time, and if the universe is expanding, that expands. It's not the whole radius of it. It's the distance between any two things in the universe, say two galaxies. And that is why, if you remember, when I showed you a picture of the rubber band expanding, or a uh, picture of the balloon uh, uh, being blown into, or the raisins in a cake expanding. Think of it as the distance between two of those raisins or two of those spots on the balloon. That is kind of, you can define that as the distance uh, scale. Right? And when you, you know, solve Einstein's equations, you have to uh, dif- write, write the equation in terms of some kind of a R as a function of T. And that R is your distance between any two uh, parts of space-time in the function of T. Right? So that is plotted in that plot. And that, in a closed universe, goes out and comes back again, which means that if you have two galaxies in the universe, as the universe expands, they go away from each other. But as the universe comes back, it comes back again. And Hawking in his book, you go and read Hawking's book, it's interesting, talks about how in a closed universe, if the universe came back into a big crunch, all the galaxies will come back and then um, and then join together and the universe will become one point again, uh, which was still a possibility in the 1980s. Now we know because the universe is accelerating, it's never going to happen. So that's uh, one of the questions that there are on the, um, uh, on the chat box. Um, I'm going to read uh, again accretion disks. I'm not sure why people are asking me this because I didn't talk about them. Um, and I don't see any other questions that relate to what I've done. So thank you very much. Um, I um, would take leave of you right now. Uh, I hope you have fun with the other lectures. I'm going to come back in week four, uh, I think, uh, and talk about uh, Glasses of Galaxy.